All right, and I'll wait just a few minutes for folks to pop in from the waiting room. Good afternoon, folks. If you're joining us, uh, stay tuned. We're just going to give it one more minute so folks can pop in from the waiting room before we go ahead and begin. Okay, great. My colleague can continue to admit folks while we go ahead and begin in the interest of time. Um, so thank you so much, folks who are joining us. This is the final presentation of our spring lecture series. Uh, we've been able to offer, I think this is now our fifth workshop in the spring, and then we'll have a workshop series in the fall too. So keep your eye out for that schedule to be released soon. Uh, we are excited because we have Audrey Pongs with uh, Greenbelt Growers joining us today. I saw her give this presentation at another event, and I've never <laughs> seen anybody who is so excited about grasses and knowledgeable of native grasses. So I uh, stalked her after the presentation <laughs> and asked her if she would jump on um, and present this for our customers too. Uh, she's prepared about a 30 minute presentation. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A box. It should be an icon at the bottom of your screen to go ahead and type in your questions so they aren't forgotten. Um, but we'll also provide the opportunity at the end for anybody to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question in real time. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Audrey. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Like she said, I'm Audrey Pongs, and I'm here on behalf of Greenbelt Growers. Uh, we are a native plant nursery with about 30 years of experience in the industry, and I have some wonderful options for those of you looking to replace your lawn. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So let's just dive right in. We're gonna be discussing drought tolerant plants as lawn replacements. And I always like to start with a little history. I think it's really important to understand context, understand why it matters. Why are we here? Why is this even something that we're talking about? In the United States, lawns are an essential part of the American dream and they're a main feature in our community and parks. But why is that? And you might be shocked to find out that this was a landscape trend that literally just took over. So Thomas Jefferson was impressed by the lawns that he saw in Europe and brought the idea of a large manicured lawn to America. Other people of the time copied him and quickly lawns became a landscape feature of the upper and middle class. Everyone had them. Fascination with turf cultivation and recreation designed to utilize these open spaces grew through the century and lawnmowers and different sports all focusing around lawns came on the scene in less than 20 years after this trend was established. We had sports like golf, lawn bowling, and croquet. As prosperity increased, people moved to the suburbs. In the wake of destruction from two world wars, conformity, beauty, and success was on everyone's mind. Developers recognized this trend and began selling landscape track houses. By the 1950s, a neat green swath was standard with every suburban home, and your ability to maintain a beautiful manicured lawn became sort of this unspoken status symbol. I mean, in advertising, books, society, the lawn was a symbol of success. And that brings us to where we are today. But honestly, it's no surprise that turf caught on because if, if you look, turf is just gorgeous. Why am I here though? I'm here to tell you that lawns are bad, right? No, <laughs> lawns can be a wonderful thing and drought tolerant grasses can get us there. In our current climate, thirsty lawns appear to be a luxury we, a luxury we can no longer afford. And as we face increased demands on our precious water resources, tearing out the seemingly useless turf is the obvious solution. But by doing so, yes, we can mitigate some of the negatives of maintaining turf grass, you know, fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides, irrigation, regular maintenance, everything that we think is bad about lawn. But we also lose the positives of which there are many. And if we move past these chemical needs and the water use of lawn, and we focus on those mental and environmental benefits that a lawn can provide, it becomes obvious that turf is not useless after all. 
I will quickly highlight a few of these um, before we get started on different plants that we can use, and we'll just start with a mental benefit. Spending time surrounded by nature is good for your mental health. Just seeing plants is enough to boost mood and cognitive fun function. There is significant direct correlation between the amount of living green time a person experiences. So not just the amount of time you spend near the color green, but the amount of time you spend with green plants, living green. And there's direct correlation between positive and healthy mental state and these experiences. We are people of the earth. This obviously makes sense. We came from the wilderness, we covered it in concrete. Of course, we're going to miss time in nature. And then I also do art. I am an artist, so I have a little color theory for you. The color green is considered a calming color. It's a color that makes people feel centered and secure. By tearing out the lawns in our public spaces and replacing them with xeriscape, so like, you know, those low water, mostly concrete landscape designs, gravel or artificial turf, we reduce our green time and we can expect to dampen our mental health as well. So just take a second and think about the pandemic plant craze. Almost immediately after being isolated from the world, we sought to fill our space with living plants. People covered their walls in green. They became plant experts. People who had no idea what a plant was before suddenly was an indoor house expert. And to the point that even Ikea got in on this craze and they produced greenhouse cabinets. What else did people do? They rushed to escape in nature. Outdoor recreation, national parks and forests attracted like record numbers and new clientele looking for relief from their isolation. When we were isolated, we looked to nature to maintain sanity. And this is a testament to the importance of living green space and our desire to feel connected. Okay, so obviously traditional turf requires frequent irrigation to stay green and vibrant, and this is a problem. But that fact aside, the patches of grass in our yards and parks are a key component in the water cycle. So just another reason, why does turf matter? Why do we care about turf? Lawns reduce runoff and erosion, providing a pathway for rainfall to seep back into underground reservoirs, so replenishing our water supply, and they also directly affect the rate of evaporation. So plants do this thing called evapotranspiration. That's the long scientific word for what this is. And basically what happens is that plant foliage shades the ground and helps topsoil retain moisture longer and water moving through the plants draws moisture up and into the atmosphere at a controlled rate. So that evapotranspiration is a controlled rate at which water moves back into the atmosphere. And that makes it possible to use the available water in the soil over a longer period of time. So essentially, plants function to protect topsoil moisture and to extend the environmental benefits of rainfall. And in effect, removing lawns completely would not really be a air quotes water wise solution as it would magnify the local effects of drought conditions. Okay, so I know you must feel like at this point that we're never gonna get there, but we're almost there, I promise. <laughs> so our background is complete and now we're all on the same page about why we have lawns and why we care if we lose them. The future may seem hopeless, but there is a solution. And this is where our unexpected hero, native and naturalized grasses swoop in to save the day. Practically everyone has a lawn and practically everyone would like to keep it if they can. And by utilizing drought tolerant grasses suitable for landscape use, it's possible to drastically cut water use without asking our neighbors to give up a key component of our culture. I wanna take a moment to note that phrase suitable for landscape use. So there is the ideal world and there is the real world. And unfortunately we live in the real world. So ultimately we do want to be successful. Like the goal here is to have a successful, beautiful lawn replacement. And sometimes that means that we have to use a cultivar. So a plant that's been bred specifically for landscape use of a native grass or a non-invasive grass, simply because it's just better suited to a landscape environment. So for my, purists out there, unfortunately, sometimes we do have to compromise just so that we can all be successful and have those beautiful lawns. On that note, what makes a drought tolerant grass a viable lawn replacement? For a drought tolerant grass to be a successful lawn replacement, it must have these characteristics. So it must be mowable, walkable, and have a visual similarity to turf. Those are the three things that, in my opinion, make 
a viable lawn replacement. Those are three keys. Everything else after that is superfluous. So replicating a lawn with water efficient plants is great. Like that is an amazing goal and we wanna do that. But I would like to just introduce this idea and take it one step further and talk about the idea of a mowable meadow. <laughs> That's very difficult to say. If you wanna to try to say it three times fast, I challenge you, it's hard. <laughs> but what is a mowable meadow? And that is a garden of grasses that can be a textural focal piece, or it can also be mowed for recreational use. And why am I mentioning this over just like the traditional monoculture lawn? It is not only a visual stimulating multi-species planting, so multiple different kinds of grasses altogether, but it has the added benefit of being a valuable resource for insects and small animals. It's a biodiversity hotspot. So native gardens enhance the lawn benefits I previously mentioned by becoming this keyword biodiversity hotspots or a place where many species can thrive together. And it becomes a bridge between conservation areas that allow for genetic exchange and facilitate migration. So the more native gardens that are planted, the more effective this bridge becomes. These photos up here on your screen right now are just a few of the insects and birds that use our nursery to rest, reproduce and feed. And as you can see, these plants are not even in their permanent homes, but they are already providing a service to our tiny neighbors. So all of these here that you see are native insects and these eggs are from a killdeer. Killdeers love the nursery. I don't know why. They like to lay their eggs in the gravel pathways and it, it, it causes a little chaos, but it's okay. We're happy to have them. Okay, so finally, finally we're here. The moment you've been waiting for our recommendations for lawn replacements in meadows. These grasses fit all the criteria that I previously stated. And I wanna just loop back to those successful gardens, the idea of success. The following plants that I'm about to talk about are easy to grow, easy to source, and um, are industry proven for success. So what does that mean? That means that you will be successful at growing them. It's not gonna be a difficult learning curve. You can get them at almost any garden center or there are plenty of nurseries throughout California that have these plants available for you. And they're industry proven for success. That means that they've been in the landscape industry a while and whether or not they've been super popular, they've been trialed. And so we know that these can be grown successfully and that they can stand up to whatever abuse is about to be thrown at them. So I feel confident <laughs> talking about these specific grasses and giving them a stamp of approval. So when it comes to choosing the right plants for your yard, there are a couple key things to consider. I'm gonna start with grasses for warm climate, and then I have another where I have grasses for cool climate. But we wanna consider how much sun, water, and maintenance this lawn will receive. Also, you need to consider your own wants when it comes to design and aesthetics. You need to talk to yourself and decide, is my goal to just replicate my lawn in a way that is water-wise and environmentally friendly and still maintain that beautiful look, or is, Am I open to going beyond that and having a unique and wonderful yard that is also water friendly and beautiful? I have broken this into two categories. I think I already said this warm, dry, and warm, wet. We're going to start with the warm, dry, sunny areas. So these plants will remain attractive in a landscape with minimal water and maintenance. In an effort to cut down on how many times I'm going to need to repeat myself, I've listed all the shared characteristics here, and then we'll go through each grass individually afterwards. But once established, these grasses will require practically no supplemental water to survive. Occasional irrigation will help prevent dormancy and keep the grass, grasses lush year round. So if you do wanna have like that green lawn look all year, you will occasionally need to water. And they are highly adaptable and can be grown throughout California in any well-drained soil. So wherever you live, these plants can be successful with a little experimenting. When it comes to maintenance, um, we do suggest that you fertilize well and whenever needed during the spring and fall. So this is individual and unique depending on your yard and your needs, but we do recommend that you fertilize during the growing season. All of the falling grasses can be mowed regularly and can be left to mimic a traditional lawn or they can be left natural and beautiful in their own light, but you do wanna mow at least once a year, remove that dead growth and maintain healthy plants. Um, remember, this is key, I'll repeat it again, a landscaped environment is an augmented reality. So with a little experimenting, anyone can have a successful garden. Okay, first up, this is a really cool one, Agrostis pellens. I consider this one a lawn replacement in its truest form, and that's why we started with this one. 
It's called bent grass and it's a running grass that grows through rhizomes. I consider this the best choice for recreational use as the rhizomes quickly fill in the gap. So this grass recovers very quickly from a little bit of trauma. If you have like um, sporting events or parties or regular walking, anytime that this is gonna be torn apart, if you have pets, this is probably one of your best options for pets because those rhizomes help fill in the gaps quickly. So your dead spots will disappear relatively quickly. You can expect it to have a light green and even texture. And it, another thing that makes this grass really cool is it's ideal. For, oh, sorry, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold. <clears throat> it's ideal for the lazy gardener as it grows very, very slowly and you can mow it very short. So you hardly ever have to mow this and you can still have a beautiful lawn. Or if you live somewhere where you have um, an HOA, or some sort of strict guidelines as to what your lawn needs to look, this is a great choice for you. A negative is that it is easily overwatered. So if you do live somewhere cooler, it is very easy to overwater this grass and kill it. It really does not want to be watered. Another one of my absolute favorite favorites is buffalo grass. So this is the native buffalo grass. Um, it's a warm season grass. It is very, very soft, wispy texture. It's wonderful to touch. It's wonderful to fill. You love being on it. It has a blue green color. It's another great, true, air quotes, true lawn replacement because it spreads by rhizomes. So again, it's well suited to a high traffic area, but it needs sufficient time to recover because it does grow slowly. This grass is ideal for Southern California, the Central Valley, Northern inland climates. We've seen success with it all over the state and the same negatives. It is easily overwatered, but if you do want that evergreen look, maybe don't pick this particular species or mix it in with a few others because it will have a dormant period in the winter, even with water and even in warm climates, it is not um, cultivated. It is truly a native grass. Uh, if you do want one that is gonna be green more often and have that more vibrant fill, the UC Verde version is a great cultivar. We like that one as well. Um, it's just sometimes a little bit more difficult to source. Another Budalua, this one's Budalua gracilis. It's absolutely stunning. If you just wanna take a second to look at those beautiful seed heads, it's called mosquito grass. This is another warm season grass. It has that nice meadow look and it will grow to roughly six inches tall. So you don't have to mow it, but it's not, it's not super large, but it's also not a very low growing grass like the previous one. It's ideal for Southern California, again, Central Valley in climates. The negative would be that it is easily overwatered and also will have that dormant period in the winter, even in warm climates, and even with water. Again, it's not super cultivated, so it does have its natural cycle still part of its life. It's not dead. <laughs> Trust me, when plants are dormant, they're not dead. I know they look dead and it can be discouraging. They're just taking a nap. They're resting, gearing up for spring, ready to explode in beautiful blossom. This is an, another Budalua, Budalua curtipendula going to have the same information I just covered before, except for this one is very green. So the previous ones were blue, green, very soft. This one's a bit more broad leafed, has a very bright green texture, another warm season grass. And so again, same information as before. If you wanna get kind of creative, throw all the Budalua's together and create this beautiful lawn and it'll be stunning, absolutely fantastic. They're designed to be with each other. Okay, this one's really, really cool. It has a bit of a red color to it when it blooms. This is another warm season grass, so Aristida purpurea can be found all throughout the Western United States, and it's the most drought tolerant grass that we have available. So after that establishment period, that first year, you should not have to expect to water it at all. It will still survive. But if you do wish to stave off dormancy and keep it evergreen, expect to have to do some occasional watering through the summer just to keep it green into the winter. It'll grow up to two feet, two feet tall, with, so that depends on how much you water. Less water, shorter grass. More water, taller, more vibrant grass. So keep that in mind. But it's ideal for anyone who's looking to cheaply and rapidly fill space with texture and color anywhere in the state. So like I said, it grows all throughout the Western United States. We went on a road trip last year and I saw it in the Rockies. So it's everywhere. But a negative is that it's easily overwatered and it can be slightly air quotes invasive in a planned landscape because wherever it is, it does want to reseed and fill. It's very good at that. So if you do plant this in your yard, you will have to maintain the edges and keep it wherever it is that you want it. And it's another one that's great for the lazy gardener. No water needs, almost no fertilizer needs, and it can be mowed very short. So down to like two inches. So if you did want to regularly mow it, you can keep it very short and maintain 
that lovely cropped lawn look. This one I'm very excited about. This is my absolute favorite grass. It is not a lawn replacement, but it is excellent for covering space and it is beautiful in a meadow. It's just a stunning grass. This is Mullenbergia rigens or deer grass. It's a beautiful mound grass with thin pale green leaves, a spike-like tan inflorescence. Again, this is a warm season grass, but plot twist, it is evergreen in the landscaped environment because it does receive irrigation year round. So if you occasionally water it once or twice a month for the entire year, it will stay green and beautiful. It is very, very, very drought tolerant. So you do not have to water this at all. Same thing with Arista. It will be gorgeous with or without water. It gets roughly three by three feet, spikes out to about five feet. And you can want to get this from somewhere that you can trust because again, it is a natural plant. So it hasn't been highly cultivated. So if uniformity is important to you, maybe don't pick this one as the size can vary and the texture can vary in between different plants in their location. It's an excellent focal point, absolutely stunning. Negatives, none that I can think of. It's pretty much bulletproof. If you're just getting into drought tolerant grasses, it's a great one for you. If you can kill it, please write me because I want to know how you did it. It doesn't die. <laughs> so if you can kill it, you don't deserve plants. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. <laughs> okay, so enough for the warm climates. We now have grasses for cool climates. The following are going to be ideal for those warm, wet, shady areas or a cool, wet, shady area meaning those coastal climates, riparian areas, or heavily shaded yards. All of these plants, again, are going to remain attractive in a landscape with minimal water and maintenance. And it's possible to successfully grow these inland and still have a beautiful lawn, but you will have to expect to need to water like three times a month or so, depending on your yard, versus the other ones I talked about where inland you don't have to water at all. So there will be slight difference there. And I went ahead and listed the shared characteristics so you don't have to hear me talk about them repeatedly. These are going to require very little supplemental water after their initial establishment period. Occasional irrigation will help prevent dormancy, keep them evergreen all year. Um, they are almost all of these are going to be evergreen anyways, but that water will help them, especially if you live somewhere warm and dry. They are highly adaptable. Most of California, well-drained well soil. And again, when it comes to fertilizing, we're going to want to fertilize in the spring or in the fall. And they can all be mowed regularly to mimic a traditional lawn or left natural and trimmed once a year to remove dead growth and maintain healthy plants. Remember that a landscaped environment is an augmented reality. So with a little experimenting, anyone can have a successful garden. With a little experimenting, anyone can be successful. So don't give up. You got to give them a chance. First one, super amazing lawn replacement. Um, it does have a bit of a bad rap. People do think you can't be successful with Festuca rubra or California fescue. In hot, dry climates, you can. We've seen a lot of success. You do have to have a regular irrigation schedule, and it does require a little bit more maintenance. But if you want to have the, the fescue lawn, you want to stick to the fescue lawn, excellent, excellent choice. It's evergreen. It's going to be lush and green, just like the lawn that you want. Um, in hot, sunny areas, it does get a bit of a red tinge to it. So do keep that in mind. We suggest that you use the cultivar Festuca rubra malate. This is going to be the most common one that you find out there. It's excellent because it is more resistant to rust than the native natural fescue. It has a better climate range. So this is the particular cultivar we've had success with in hot, dry places. Um, for example, this photo is from Hollister. So it's hot, it's dry, it's sunny, and this grass looks fantastic. And then also, again, readily available. So you can push its climate range and it's everywhere. Carex pragracillus. So not technically a grass. This is a sedge, but it still does give you that beautiful lawn look. And it's evergreen. So that's amazing. And it's not super bristly to touch. It does have a nice texture to walk on. It grows to about one foot by a foot wide. It'll spread slowly to fill its available space. So if you are going to be planting a lawn with this, we do suggest you use smaller plants closer together so you can get that lawn look faster. And it looks its best with moderate foot traffic, so not something you're going to want to walk on regularly, not very resistant to pets, but beautiful to look at. We suggest the cultivar Chisai for Carex pragracillus because, again, it's more resistant to rust and other fungal infections. It's better suited to a drought environment or a full sun environment. 
and it's readily available. Almost everyone will have Chisai. This is Carex Panza. As you can see, it looks almost identical to Carex Pregracillus, but I separate them because they are technically two separate plants from California. However, they're gonna have the same information. They look almost identical. They function the same way and they're both evergreen and beautiful. So industry interchangeable, generally there's not a lot of specific, not a lot of distinction between the two, but I thought I would go ahead and separate those for you just in case. This is a beautiful, wonderful one that I've, okay, so I've kind of looped this multiple species into one description here because the difference between all of them is simply the shape of their flowers and their external plant morphology and not the way that they are maintained. So Cesleria cerulea or Cesleria autumnalis and their cultivars are very versatile grasses with lush blue-green leaves. They're going to give you kind of a kind of a lawn similar to what St. Augustine would look like. So that very rough textured lawn, but very green and beautiful. They'll grow to about a foot by foot wide and they'll slowly spread to fill space. So again, if you want to um, fill your space quickly and get that lawn look quickly, we suggest you use smaller plants closer together. It does best with occasional mowing. So we won't want to cut this one really short. You won't want to mow it all the time, but once or twice a month and to about three or four inches will be great. It'll be beautiful. It can tolerate shade or sun. It is very drought tolerant as well, except for in hot, dry climates, you will want to water in the summer. Moderate foot traffic has relatively decent pet tolerance. It's available in so many cultivars. There's so many different types. There's greenly, cerulea, autumnalis, brush strokes, and they're all beautiful. You can blend them together. It's fantastic. And it's really fun because of all this difference in morphology, you can get a couple different types throw them together, leave your lawn natural and have a beautiful, easy meadow, or you can mow them and have a gorgeous uniform meadow and with this little surprise. And we, I think it's dynamic, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. It's also more resistant to rust. So if you live somewhere wetter and you expect to have rust problems or you regularly have fungal issues in your landscape, this is a great choice. And suited to full sun, drought tolerant, I just wanted to make sure I covered everything. Okay, so this, Dyscamsia cespitosa. Sorry, I stumble over my pronunciation sometimes because there's so much disparity in the plant world over how you should say things. But this one is not a true lawn replacement. So this is going to be one of those accent plants because it is a mounding plant and does get a pretty decent size, two or three feet tall, depending on how much water you give it. The flowers, though, are beautiful. The texture is wonderful. It's a cool season grass, so great to combine with your warm season grasses, but you do want to use caution if you are going to mow it. As you can't, as it ages, you can't mow it shorter than like four or six inches because the center will die out. That'll be too much exposure, exposure to the environment and your mound will have like that dead looking clump in the middle and there's not much you can do after you do that. So do use caution there when you trim this grass back that you don't trim it too short and cause that middle to die. I like this one as an accent plant because these flowers are just so soft and wispy. When they bloom and they grow out through the winter and into the fall, they're just this lovely like cloud-like texture above your lawn or above your meadow. It's beautiful. Another wonderful accent plant is Calamagrostis foliosa. I love this one because when it's mature, I don't have a photo of this and I need to get one. But when it's mature, it looks like a gorgeous firework. So those little flowers stick out as those tight tails. And then as they mature, they open into something very similar to what I just showed you on the last side for Dyscamsia. And they're beautiful. The purple tinge, it's gorgeous. Great to combine with Cesleria or to combine with like Aristida. They would be beautiful together. This is a cool season bunch grass. So again, it's going to be ideal for those coastal climates, but it's going to require significant irrigation inland. So this is probably not your best choice there. It'll grow to about two or three feet tall and wide. We'll want to mow this one once a year at the end of winter. And again, you do need to be careful to protect the crown, protect the center of the plant. So if you do mow it and you trim it back between four and six inches is ideal. It's a beautiful focal point. Another one of my absolute favorites. Although I don't know if you've noticed, but all of these are my favorites. <laughs> I am not, <laughs> there's a lot of cool things out there. And this is a special request. So this is not a graph. We do not have this available, but I did want to cover this for you because it is something that 
apparently there's a lot of attention about right now. So common lipia or carafia is a beautiful. It's not a grass, it's a herbaceous plant that just came from Japan and has been on trial by UC Davis and UCR and recently approved as a wonderful lawn replacement. Some of its noteworthy features are that it's extremely drought tolerant and it has deep roots. So deep roots is key because deep roots hold soil together and they give plants access to more resources. So deep rooting is a wonderful feature that you do wanna look out for. It will require only occasional watering just to keep it green and beautiful after it's established so you're solid. And you can expect this to be a solid green carpet, so a visual lawn replacement three to five months after planting, which is relatively quick. Uh, it's also hard not to miss these beautiful, stunning little flowers that pop up early in the spring and just add that extra little hint of excitement that we usually miss when we put in drought tolerant landscapes. We miss that color and that excitement. We unfortunately are not licensed to sell this, but you are available to get it from the sod company Delta Bluegrass. And though, even though this is a hybrid from Japan, it's sterile. So that's pretty impressive. And that means that the risk of escaping and becoming an invasive plant is minimal um, because it doesn't produce seed. So they won't be spreading beyond like where you plant it. That's actually really fantastic. And if you are a native lover and you are very much in luck because we do have several species of Lipia native to California and they will look very similar to this and provide basically the same benefits. You can get these plants at Growing Works, not far from your homes, or Calscape, so C-A-L-S-C-A-P-E.com has a list of all of the native lipias of, and all the nurseries where they're available and you can buy them in California. And most of them will have them in quantities large enough for a lawn replacement project. Most of them are, are decent size and do wholesale like we do. Uh, on the last slide, I'm gonna have links available for you. So don't freak out, you can screenshot them or take a picture, all that information is there. We're going to finish with some quick tips for success. Remember how I said before, success is key. Augmented reality, I want you to be successful and to have beautiful yard. So all of these plants are going to require well-drained soil. Moisture is key. So it is important to give your plants the chance to be successful and the chance to grow and be beautiful. So keeping the soil moist after planting is key, but not saturation. When doing a lawn replacement, keep in mind that proper prep is your friend. Prep now, work less later. So do a weed kill, whichever way works for you, as long as you're starting with a blank slate. So however you decide you wanna do that, chemical free, or you wanna be quick about it and just scrape the earth, however you wanna do it, do your weed kill. It's super important. We're going to want to irrigate before and after planting. It's easier to dig in soft moist dirt than it is to dig in hard dry dirt. So go ahead and do yourself a favor and moisten up your work area before you get started. Um, this is something that I sometimes forget to mention, but you need to keep in mind when you're doing a planting, when you're planting any plant, that you're taking this plant from a perfect environment designed for its ultimate success and for it to be beautiful. And you are throwing it into a new one where it has nothing and no access to anything. So you need to give the plant a chance to establish roots and provide regular irrigation post planting. Plants access their environment through roots. And when you take them out of the pot, what you see around the edge, the way they're all contained there, the plant can only access what it currently is able to touch. So everything else in the soil is lost to it. So until it has the chance to grow and spread its roots and reach out to its friends for help, to reach out in the soil farther and reach moisture over there, nutritional resources over there, beyond its little zone, it's very vulnerable. So you need to give it a chance to grow those roots and access its environment. So that's why we talk about the establishment period, that first year where grasses are very fragile and require extra care. If you are open to it, pre-emergent is your friend. So remember the goal is success. You wanna give the plants a chance to shade out their potential competition to grow big and healthy and strong. So it is always a good idea, but if chemical assistance does not align with your philosophy, consistently weed your new planting, especially of weedy grasses. Give your plants a chance to be successful. Planting in early fall or spring, you know, avoiding those hot 
days of summer will also help you be much more successful and lose a lot and keep most of your plants alive. We always suggest that you use smaller plants when you're looking for that traditional lawn look. So four inch or liners, less expensive for you and it'll fill in more quickly. So it'll provide that ground cover faster and you'll have that lawn look quicker, more quickly. Remember to consider seasonality in your garden. So combine some winter and summer dormant plants if you want something evergreen or go ahead and just pick an evergreen plant to begin with to have that beautiful meadow year round or that beautiful lawn year round. And then have fun with it. It is your yard. This is for you to play. Combine some filler plants, throw in some buffalo grass and some blonde abition, and then just the mullen version on the side that catch the wind. Like have fun, get creative and enjoy your yard because this is where, this is your happy space. This is where you should be excited to be. Okay, so putting it all together. Lawns are beautiful. They're more than a status symbol. They're an important point important component of our water cycle and they play a role in our mental health so we can reduce our environmental impacts and still have beautiful lawns and I want us all to be successful and to grow beautiful lawns so I'll go ahead and um, I've made a QR code here for you all save it for later it is a link to a page that I put together with all the information on all of the plants that I covered today and um, like how to plant them, how they grow, information about their history and things like that will all be there. And then this is where I was talking about before, calscape.com and the California Native Plant Society have amazing additional resources for water-wise lawn replacements and also have places beyond us that are open to the public and sell plenty of grasses in quantities that are usable to you. And if you're not done learning or if you have questions that you didn't think about and you thought about later and you still want me to answer them, we are on Instagram, so you can feel free to reach out there or follow us. It's very exciting. We have all good things. Perfect. Thank you so much, Audrey. Like I said at the beginning, I'd never met anyone who was so excited or found so much beauty in grasses other than when I've heard her give this presentation. Um, I will also add in a plug. Several of the grasses that she mentioned are growing in our sustainability garden. So if you haven't been there yet, it's located at Las Virginas Municipal Water District headquarters, which is 4232 Las Virginas Road in Calabasas. Um, so in there, we have the blonde ambition that you discussed, some several Mullenbergia, California fescue, several carrots growing. So if you want to come and see these grasses growing, you know, in the environment, certainly head out to Greenbelt Growers um, or pop over to Las Virginas HQ. Uh, the sustainability garden is open to the public 24-7 and has signage for a self-guided tour. So please come on over if you want to see that. Um, otherwise, I haven't seen any questions pop up in the Q&A. Um, so before I open it up to the audience, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. So if folks are shy about speaking up, um, we'll go ahead and stop the recording. But before I do, I just wanna thank Audrey again for your time and for delivering this presentation, sharing your, your knowledge and your enthusiasm with us. 